Well, thank you much. I put this one up myself as my first slide, so I'd know what it was I was supposed to talk about. One of the things I'm going to promise you is I'm not going to try and cram 40 years of entomology into 40 minutes. Uh, but we will, I mean, I'm planning on telling a few war stories. In fact, if I was doing a real history, there are some people here who would be better qualified to do that. Uh, for example, Tom Turpin got here about a month before me, so he has a month more history. And Gary Bennett was uh, at least a year ahead of me, and he's still around. And then there, Virginia Ferris, who I think, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I, thought, I think it was, didn't, Virginia, weren't you the one that talked John Perdue into donating the property? <laughs> or they, I think so. Anyway, so she's, she's the one who really has the good historical perspective here. But I am going to talk about some of these things, and this is going to be kind of a casual. I, the only reason I wore a tie, as I explained to some others, is just, ooh, he's wearing a tie. I've never seen that before. Well, so you people would think maybe I actually knew what I was talking about. But uh, I'm going to uh, basically plop myself on a stool and, uh, I, and tell war stories. I'm going to talk more about this guy down here in the corner than anybody else because I know more about him than I do anybody else. But I will put it in a, a bit of perspective in the university, in the, de the department at least. And uh, I am going to be absolutely retiring very shortly after Bug Bowl on the first part of May. And so this is kind of my swan song. This is my... Uh, uh, final report to the department and, uh, about what uh, I, some of the things at least that I've accomplished during the course of my tenure here. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is how did I get here anyway? Uh, this is kind of a long story but it's one that I'd like to share with you. All my growing up, I planned on becoming an artist of some kind. And so when I uh, attended as a freshman, uh, signed up for classes for at the University of Utah, uh, I decided I was going to be an art major. So I signed up for basic drawing 101, whatever it was. And uh, I went to class. And the first day of class, the teacher asked, called the roll, of course. And it was in alphabetical order and asked everybody what their major was. And some people said fine art, commercial art, 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 art yeah, ec architecture, uh, art history, art education. They were saying all these different things. And I thought, wow, I just thought you majored in art. <laughs> you know, I didn't realize I had all these other options. Well, fortunately or unfortunately, someone ahead of me said undecided. I said, oh, that's what I am. I don't know which one of these areas I want to go in yet. So I said undecided. Well, this same individual taught all of the introductory courses. In my freshman year, I had three classes from this guy. And I could not get better than a C out of him, no matter how hard I tried. And after getting all A's and A pluses in high school art classes and having kind of a big head, this was very ego deflating. And so without ever talk, because as freshman year, I was too dumb and too scared of these highfalutin professors to even go to him and say, what am I doing wrong? You know, how can I improve? I just concluded all on my own that I obviously wasn't cutting it in art and I ought to get into something else that maybe I could actually graduate in. So I looked at all the, the entrance exam scores. This was before the kind of tests we have now. But I said math, absolutely not. Chemistry, don't think so. Oh, biology. I always got good grades in biology. Therefore, I will major in biology. And, uh, and that's what I did. It wasn't until a couple years later I found out that it was this individual's own personal philosophy to not give higher than a C to a non-art major no matter how well they did. So my having declared myself uh, undecided relegated me to C's and D's. I'll never know how well I actually did, I guess. But nevertheless, it led me in a very different direction. Uh, initially, I was planning on becoming a high school biology teacher, and I went through the whole thing, did my student teaching and everything. But in there, I was take, took an evolution course from a man by the name of George Edmonds, who just happened to be the world's leading authority on mayflies at the time. And uh, he one day showed a number of uh, pen and ink drawings of mayfly larvae and showing how they're 
different appendages and their gills and things were adapted for different environmental situations. And I was enthralled with these drawings. They were these highly detailed, stippled, really fine things. And I, was, I, I thought they were the most amazing thing I had ever seen. And he mentioned one day that he was losing his illustrator, and if anybody knew of anyone that was interested, to let him know. Well, I was pushing a broom in a motel to earn extra money at the time, and this sounded a little bit more interesting than that, so I went to him, talked to him, showed him some of my stuff, and he hired me. And I put myself all the way through my bachelor's degree illustrating for him. <coughs> I was not able to get any scholarships. There weren't that many anyway at the time, and secondly, uh, my grades <laughs> didn't qualify me for any scholarships uh, in my early years. But uh, that took me in a whole other direction. And uh, I had no plans on becoming an entomologist. Like I say, I planned on becoming a high school biology teacher. But the more I drew and the more I looked and the more I interacted with other graduates, with graduate students who uh, were doing entomological projects, the more fascinated and the more hooked on the whole thing I became. I decided uh, when I graduated to go on and get my master's and I did the, the Damsel Flies of Utah for my master's and uh, enjoyed that. And uh, it was at a time I, uh, having interacted with a lot of his graduate students and one of those uh, graduate students I interacted with was Pat McCafferty who just retired this past year and many of you at least know who he was, some of you don't, I'm sure. But uh, I'd illustrated his master's thesis and then he went to uh, Georgia and got his PhD under Herb Ross there and then he took a job in, uh, at Dixie College in Southern, in St. George, Utah and finished up his thesis in extension and I went down and worked with him for two, year, two weeks, not two years, two weeks illustrating his uh, PhD thesis for him. And he'd applied for a job here, and he'd been out for his interview before I went down. Well, while I was down there, he got the phone call from uh, John Osmond, who's the department head, informing him that he'd gotten the job. And so he was excited. One of his positions was to be the director of the uh, uh, Entomology Museum. So I mentioned to him, gee, you know, if there's ever an opening for uh, an illustrator or for a museum curator, uh, I'd had some experience doing that at University of Utah for about a year. Uh, let me know, I'd be interested. Well, it was only a f few months later, uh, I got a phone call from Pat saying, hey, they're advertising a position for a museum curator. If you're interested, why don't you throw your hat in the ring? Well, I threw my hat in the ring, and uh, shortly thereafter, I got a phone call from uh, John Osmond. He interviewed me over the phone, sight unseen, for uh, some lengthy period of time. And then at the end of the conversation, he said, well, we'd like to hire you. When can you be here? And I said, well, I'm finishing. I was finishing up a big illustrating project for uh, Edmonds, and I told him it would be about a month before I could do that. And so I came out and uh, hired me sight unseen, which was good for me, otherwise I might not have gotten hired. But, uh, and I've been, that was, 19, that was September 1971, and I've been here ever since. Now the original job description was for a museum curator. That was the total job description. And uh, I found out later that there had been 55 people that had applied for the job. And uh, many of them were better qualified to be the museum curator than I was. And this was a brand new position. And, uh, but it was my illustrating ability that was the kicker that got me the job, because they also saw the need for illustration and had a hard time convincing everybody in the department to hire a full-time curator, but they also saw the need for an illustrator and couldn't hire a full-time illustrator. They saw a way of combining the two in me. And so, that's what got me the job. And if you had asked me when I was a senior in high school that this is what I would be doing, I would have had no idea. I didn't know you could do this sort of thing. Uh, one of the things that made me go on, for example, though, with, with Edmonds, like I say, it, it changed my course to continue to go on and get my master's degree, is I took aquatic entomology from him and uh, I was up collecting, I had a good time doing that, and I was collecting all these in the Provo River, which is a beautiful uh, 
trout stream up in the mountains in uh, north of Salt Lake. And uh, we're collecting all these big stoneflies and mayflies and caddisflies and all kinds. Of, I mean, it's just rich. And I said, boy, this doesn't get any better than this. This is really fun. And then the light bulb went off. And it was like, you mean you can get paid to do this? <laughs> and uh, so uh, that's what caused me to go on. But the, the point I'd like to make, particularly to you uh, who are still in the midst of uh, your career training, uh, is frequently our lives do take unforeseen twists and turns, and we frequently wind up in places that we uh, never supposed we would. But if we hadn't taken the journey, we'd never have gotten there in the first place. So uh, that's how I got here anyway. Uh, I gotta look at this so I know what I'm supposed to say next, I guess. Well, the next topic I want to, here we go, is uh, a little bit about what was going on here in the department in the 1970s. Again, I'm not going to give a, a complete history of all, but just <laughs> some of the little excerpts of stuff. I, a lot of these things I don't have any slides of. This is why I'm sitting here on a stool talking to you, because Whatever happened to pictures from back in 1970s that somebody may have taken, I have no idea where they are anymore. But uh, when I first, w with the exception of the Ferrises and their clan who were over in Eel still at that time, weren't you, already? Everybody else in the department was housed in old Entomology Hall, you know, now Fendler Hall. And that, that was the entire department was there. And we were, when I was there, we were crammed in with a shoehorn into that building. And uh, my office consisted of a folding table in the uh, collections room itself. And that was pretty much my office, that and a typewriter. Was before we had computers, so I had a typewriter and a folding table, and that was pretty much it. <coughs> uh, one of the things that was interesting at the time, uh, which has gone through a major evolution, I guess, is there was a very strong taxonomic component to the department at that time. We had, for example, uh, both at the time, and a couple of these people had just retired as I, uh, before I got here, but Leland Chandler w uh, was worked on bees, and as a result, we have one of the country's best, I'm told by bumblebee experts, one of the best bumblebee collections in the country as well as other solitary bees, very good. Uh, B.L. Wood Montgomery, who had just retired just before I got here, had amassed an extremely large dragonfly collection and worked on dragonflies. Of course, McCafferty worked on mayflies, and Todd Harris, uh, who came a year or two after us, um, worked on caddisflies. In addition, a lot of the extension staff also had a taxonomic sideline that they worked on in addition, in addition to their extension stuff. For example, Ray Everly, who had just again had retired, worked on ground beetles, and we've got a very, very large carabid collection as a result. George Gould walked on, worked on water striders, Don Shooter worked on scale insects, and Bob Meyer worked on dolicopoted and other small fly families like that. And uh, one of the things, so, so there was a lot of the collection that we have now uh, came from these people that, that, that during that time. One of the things that we discovered when we first got here is I needed a microscope and I needed some other supplies and I needed museum supplies. And Tom Turpin and I were talking about this a little bit this morning and we're not sure exactly how it worked, but it seemed like the dean divvied out the money to the departments and if he didn't think it was worthwhile, you didn't get the money. And, uh, you know, and, and I, we got answered like, oh, we can't afford the money right now. We just had a herd of hogs die. This was the answer, a herd of dog, hogs die and we need to replace them so we can't buy you a microscope and we can't get you unit trays or other supplies for the museum. Well, Osman informed us one of the problems uh, was that the dean at that time did not like museums and collections and uh, was not willing to fund this worthless kind of thing. So he said, if you're going to get any money, you're going to have to come up with a new name. So we brainstormed and came up with the Laboratory of Insect Diversity. And that's what we became. And so now that we were a laboratory, we got the money. I got a microscope and everything. We got well-funded then after that. 
uh, after a few years and all the other entomology collections around the country laughed at it. it just laboratory of insect diversity stuff. Uh, administrator changed and we eventually went back to what was the original name of the, of the museum, it was the Purdue Entomological Research Collection, also known as PERC. Uh, when I got here, that's a little bit of stuff, but when I, uh, I keep pointing it, pointing it in the wrong direction. Uh, there's me in 19, May of 1972, I know because it says so up here. Uh, <laughs> And when I first got here, uh, Leland Chandler, again, who worked on the bees, asked me, so what is your goal, Arwen, for uh, the, the museum? And I hadn't really thought about it, <laughs> so, but my answer was, uh, I want to uh, acquire as complete a possi as possible a representation of the Indiana insect fauna. And that really has become the goal all these years for the museum. And this was my tally board here with, uh, we'd added uh, how many species and how many total 28,000 specimens that year and about, uh, added a thousand new species to the collection just in that, that one year. Uh, and over the years, and I thought, please, this next one is, uh, yeah. Whoops, that was, uh, I guess, I, there we go, I'll go, I'll go back to the other one. Uh, the entomological uh, collections in 1971, when I got here, we estimated we had about 1.2 million specimens. Uh, now we have over 2 million. Uh, I've, during my tenure, we've added over 800,000 specimens to the collection, and we've added uh, over 12,500 new species to the collection. This is a worldwide representation of things that we acquired. Uh, but we have added for Indiana 3,100 new species for the state of Indiana that were not previously represented or known to be here. And put that in perspective, I estimate that there's around 16,000 potential insect species here in, in the state. And right now we have about 9,000. Uh, so we still have a long way to go, but having added a third of what was known uh, in 40 years when the collection had existed since almost the beginning of the university, at least from the 1920s, uh, it was, I, I feel it's been a good accomplishment and I'm pleased about. I put this one in, because this was, this was in 1973. For those of you who didn't know who McCafferty was, that was McCafferty and, and me, and this I thought, it's elementary, Watson, this is obviously a map of Indiana. <laughs> and I think I'm saying, ooh, you're so wise, but at least I have bigger sideburns. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that was us back in the beginning. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about outreach stuff because this is one of the things I, I feel deeply about. We had done occasional, would do an outreach talk, particularly if our kid was in elementary school and some of us would go and do, do a talk, but we weren't heavily, heavily involved until we had a uh, department retreat. And we used to have some really good department retreats, didn't we? And uh, uh, I think in the one retreat, one of the topics was how the, the problem that we were having at the time, and I don't remember what year it was, but the problem that we were having at the time of uh, not only getting numbers of students, and particularly undergraduate students, but getting quality students. And this was a problem. It was not just a problem for us, it was a problem for the sciences in general. In fact, if Pete, weren't you the one who led that discussion? Yeah, I would say you shake your head, yes, I'm the bright one that led that discussion. And I, I believe it was Pete Dunn that led that discussion. One of the conclusions that we came to was it, it, wasn't, just a, we decided it wasn't just about entomology and getting students for us, but it was about turning kids on to science in general, and particularly the biological science. So was, and we concluded that if you wait until they hit the college door, in most cases it's too late. You gotta get kids excited about science earlier. And that was when we first really started getting heavily involved with doing a lot of outreach programs and advertising. And we'd have lots of school groups coming here. We went to lots of schools, particularly elementary schools, 
and uh, I did uh, a lot of those presentations over the years because I say it was something I felt strongly about that we really ought to be doing. And uh, we've done a lot of displays, and one of the things I want to hit, I. Uh, I not only participated in the, the school outreach programs, but we had a lot of displays and poster things that we exhibited all over the place. And one of the things we got involved with, what our part department was doing, was a lot of state fair uh, presentations, and still do. And I got involved uh, with some of those and started uh, making insect models. Uh, which another thing I got into, uh, for particularly for the state fair exhibits, uh, one such as this yellow jacket here. Uh, most of these, at least some of them, are down in the boiler bug barn. You know, if you haven't seen them, you can go down there and see them. The biggest uh, one of these we ever did was entitled Monsters of the Midway. And I spent a long, long time working with the people in the display shop in developing this. It was a takeoff on the uh, Welcome to the Mid Indiana State Fair Midway sign that's down at the State Fair. And uh, I helped develop the head. This was really cool because I did the antenna, uh, modeled those, and the eyes would flash red, they had lights in them, and they were flashed on and off, and the mandibles went and the sound went on the sand. So that was kind of cool. Now down here in the corner is this little carnival barker head down there, so you can get it in perspective. And uh, this is the carnival barker, and these, these are the topics. We had this big walk-through maze, and these are all the topics that we had, ants and wasps and cicadas and termites and mosquitoes that we had freezing stuff on and models and information and all kind of stuff. But they, uh, they also had this, everything didn't go as planned. They, they had the carnival barker here and it says push me and there's a button right there on his tie. And if you push the button, the carnival barker said, oh, Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of all ages, welcome, welcome to Monsters of the Midway. And then went on to more spiel about the stuff. Anyway, that's what it was supposed to do. And they had recorded this. They, they used an old uh, telephone answering machine and recorded the message on it. And then when you pushed the button, it played the message. Well, it worked really great for the first two hours of the fair. And then all of a sudden, when you push the button, it said, a woman's voice came on, and a very pleasant woman's voice came on, and says, please leave a message after the beat. <laughs> they got it. <coughs> they did get it fixed. One of the other things I didn't show here that we had a, they made a little movie for this. Uh, it was patterned after the 1950s uh, class, you know, B uh, horror movie things with giant insects and stuff. And I had, for this, I had made an, a model of an ant, and they used this that was attacking, and there was women and children running and screaming and going, eh, and then it showed tanks coming on. And then, then it went, they did a lot of stop action, and they had this ant climbing over the top of these little miniature model houses and stuff. And then along came a little toy tank. That what they'd gotten was one of these Fourth of July uh, little tanks that you light the fuse and sparks come out the barrel of the gun. Well, that's what was supposed to happen when sparks come out the barrel of the gun. Now, this ant model was made out of styrofoam and <laughs> acrylic modeling paste and stuff, and it was kind of flammable and meldable. Well, instead of sparks coming out, this flame shooter comes out <laughs> and catches the ant on fire. <laughs> and it's so anyway, it made it kind of cool, but they apologized for having destroyed my ant, melted the head. Uh, but anyway. Uh, the biggest part where we came down to with our outreach, our biggest outreach activity, uh, obviously, is bug bowl. And we've added insecticans and other things to this. And uh, well, I was involved with uh, bug bowl from the very beginning. Of course, this was Tom Turpin's uh, conception. All right, Tom, you're there in the back there. Even though you want me to tell my version of what happened, or you want to tell your version of how things I got like started? Your okay, I'll, it'll be shorter than yours at least. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Tom was teaching uh, the Entomology 105 class, and uh, 
they decided to have a class project, and as, as Turpin is known to do, uh, to come up with the wildest thing they could think of was a cockroach race. So they had the roaches and trained them, and he got this board made with uh, uh, these plexiglass rails so that the roaches couldn't just run everywhere, keep them inside their little track. And uh, the word got out that they were going to do this. And got on the radio station and everything, and come uh, the night for the races, in addition to the class, about 130 people showed up. It was kind of, I got to see this. So it was decided that, gee, this is interesting. We ought to do it again next year and add some more entomological stuff and open it up to the public for real. And with that, our, there was a lot, we did some brainstorming. Al York threw his hat in the ring. I threw mine in. Dr. Thomas says, you know, we're really interested in supporting and being part of this. Came up with the name of Bug Bowl, and uh, it was off to the races. And uh, now it was uh, several years. We kept growing and expanding, and initially, the powers to be in the university were opposed to us even doing this. It was frivolous, it was not our job, it was wasting our time and resources, and they were not only not supportive, they were actually opposed to our doing it. Uh, we had to clean the restrooms ourselves afterwards and everything else. But anyway, after uh, that first year, about 1,200 people came, and the next year it was like 3,000, and it just kept growing, and after a few years they said, oh, not so bad. We'll take over now. <laughs> <laughs> but there were also at that time other departments started saying, hey, I, we want to get in on this too, you know. And, and so it started expanding to a few other departments. And I can still remember uh, walking past the wood lab when the first year they did it. They've wised up and gotten a lot better since. But the first year that, uh, that they participated, they had this big sign inviting people to come in and see the wonderful world of wood. And they were standing, I don't understand it. Why are all the kids going to see the insects rather than the wonderful world of wood? Well, you know, like, duh. <laughs> so, uh, and it just kept growing and expanding and pretty soon uh, it became, decided to become an entire ag school activity and that's when they decided they needed to hire uh, an ag school uh, outreach coordinator. And now it's a university-wide activity. Last year, I believe there's something like 38, something like that, wasn't it, Tom? Departments that participated. And uh, it all started with a cockroach race in Dr. Turpin's uh, uh, class. Well, that first year, like I said, it was just it was this white board they had built and, and had the tracks on it and had an oval track and a straight track and a circle thing. And uh, Byron Reed, who was one of Gary Bennett's uh, sidekicks, uh, announced that it made sense, urban industrial pest control. He announced the first year's races. But then after that, Turpin came to me and says, Arwen, you think you can make this look a little bit more like a real racetrack? So I said, I think I can. So uh, I put model railroad grass on it and, and some little miniature trees and some garbage cans, and then I got carried away. And before I was through, I had bleachers uh, full of cockroaches wearing baseball claps and sunglasses and drinking pop and weaving pennants and stuff. And uh, grass grasshopper rides, uh, <laughs> balloon vendors, and had them lined up. I didn't want to bore you with hundreds of these, but had them lined up outside the porta potty and walking their amp by fire hydrant and walking their egg capsule and baby buggy, all kind of stuff going on. And uh, my mother never thought her little boy would ever have a job where he got paid for making sunglasses for cockroaches. <laughs> Here I am. But you know, I got a lot of, well, I was, it just took a lot of time making all these little miniatures and stuff, and it was something I had fun with, and we got a lot of brainstorming and people coming up with different ideas for the little venues. But, you know, I got a lot of flack while I was working on this stuff from different people in the department that, again, why are you wasting your time doing all this really stupid stuff, you know, and you should be doing, helping me with my science, important science kind of stuff. You know, but I'm not sorry that I did it. Uh, I've personally, at least, and I've gotten more press out of this than all of the other science and stuff that I've done, and it's contributed a lot to the visibility and notoriety of, of our department. In addition to racing roaches uh, here at Bug Bowl, uh, we raced them every year. This last year was the last time because they changed the venue down there, but for about 15 years we raced them at uh, 
uh, the state fair, two shows a day every day. Uh, we've been all over the eastern half of the United States from Baltimore, Maryland, to Jacksonville, Florida, and Atlanta, and New Orleans, and Washington, D.C., and Columbus, Ohio, and Cincinnati a bunch of times, and Chicago a bunch of times, and, and as far west as Omaha, Nebraska, so we've, we've done shows all over the place. And it's gotten a lot of press, too. The whole bug bowl thing has gotten a lot of press, and particularly the cockroach races. It's been in People Magazine and National Geographic Magazine and on CNN several times. In fact, my son was working in uh, Japan a few years ago, and he called me and all excited and said, gee, Dad, I just saw you on CNN here in Japan. So uh, it's gotten around a little bit. And uh, so that's, that's kind of cool. It's good no, no uh, notoriety from Purdue. In fact, uh, we were formed uh, during that period of time that outside of total combined sports that Bug Bowl was the number one news hit for the university uh, worldwide. So that was kind of cool. Well, for those of you who haven't seen the Roach races, uh, you know, that well, I say that first year, I didn't know what was next. That first year, Byron Reed announced the races. Uh, that next year, uh, he left uh, for another job and uh, I volunteered to take over and I've been announcing the races ever since. And uh, we've got this whole show that we do. And it's been amazing. We've, we've got two races that we do. The uh, first one is the uh, tractor pull in which we have the giant Madagascar roaches pulling little miniature John Deere tractors. And Purdue, Purdue, Notre Dame and IU pull off against each other to see who's the top of the heap, so to speak. And for, unfortunately, this is one of the few times when the uh, Purdue tractor uh, lost. Uh, but most of the time, we make sure it, make sure it gets the round, one with the round wheels. Uh, <laughs> but our main event is the All-American Trot Professional Roach Racing Championships on the oval track, where we have a bunch of American roaches running around in the, in the circle, and everybody gets a big yucky laugh <laughs> out of that. And, uh, have fun calling the races, and they all have pedigrees and names. We have uh, honorary uh, roach jockeys where we'll get five uh, kids under the age of 12 up there, and we put bug hats on them, and, and we have a betting window, and anybody can place a bet, and we always have played off of current events and stuff that was going on uh, politically in the movies, uh, here at Purdue, whatever. Uh, hardest part of my job every year is coming up with names that are not going to be overly offensive, <laughs> but will still draw attention to what's going on. One of my favorites, for example, was Harry Plotter. I get it, Harry Plotter. And last year, uh, one of the winners was a gridiron guy sired by Danny Hope and damned by our only hope. <laughs> I said, yes, we didn't have Danny Hope, we'd have no hope at all. Well, now we have no hope at all. So anyway, uh, and we draw these big crowds out for the races. It's amazing. They cram them in there. Uh, you can see up here with the kids with their hats on, where there are the roach jockeys and the betting windows over there and stuff. One I really have to uh, mention is my wife, Judy, who is my head roach wrangler and has traveled around the country with me and helps out with bug bowl every year. And she's really been a, a good sport about it and has gotten really into it and is really, really good at handling the roaches and making sure the race goes well. In fact, so much so that some of her friends have nicknamed her the Roach Whisperer. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> I preach her a great, or a great deal, and I couldn't, uh, I wouldn't be here, uh, not only with the Roach races, but here in general without her, I think. I've often said that bef behind every successful man is a good woman with a sharp stick, and she's used that start sharp stick on me more than once over the years. Well, I also did some research while I was, well, actually I did a lot of research while I was here. Uh, I had three interests. I was still interested in, in the damselflies that I'd worked on at the University of Utah, so we did some of that. But because I was working closely with McCafferty, most of my research involved mayflies. And we uh, traveled all over the country uh, collecting and rearing mayflies. Because one of the problems that existed at that time was most of the species of mayflies that had been described had been described from the adults. And nobody knew what the larvae were. And it was the larvae that were the ecologically important group uh, to uh, fisheries biologists and aquatic ecologists and all the like. 
And so a lot of what we did was collecting the larvae, rearing them out, doing stage correlation stuff so we could say, aha, this is the larvae, now we know what it is. And then I could illustrate it and we could write up papers on it and, and describe these things and do keys and stuff. Uh, so it was kind of fun. The only state, contiguous state in the United States that I did not collect insects in was Rhode Island. Somehow we missed that one. <laughs> I don't know how, but we did. And uh, I was uh, fortunate enough during my career to be able to describe several new species of insects, uh, mayflies, and that's kind of a kick when you discover something that nobody's ever found before and you get to describe it and stuff. I've also uh, had several species named after me, which was also uh, considered a, a great honor by different people. So that was good. And one of those people that was part of McCafferty's lab at that time was, was uh, Dr. Robert Waltz here, who was uh, going backwards. He's now the state chemist. He was the state entomologist. And uh, way, way back, he was one of McCafferty's graduate students. And I'm going to, to roast him a little bit. His nickname while I was here was Tri-Dub. <laughs> you were aware of that, weren't you? No. <laughs> that stood for Wow Wow Waltz. Because anything you told him that was interesting, his answer was Wow, Wow, two Wows always. So it was Wow Wow, that was Tri-Dub. <laughs> so anyway, appreciated my, the long time association I've had with Bob and uh, it's been good and we've done some collecting together and stuff too over the years. So. Uh, where am I at? Okay. Uh, the other aspect, I talked about the outreach and, and the museum. My other interest is what got me going in some directions in the first place was the illustrations. As time went on here in the department, uh, the demand for my illustrations continued to increase and I was also doing a lot of freelance work for other people around the country. and. Uh, my whole training as an illustrator, as an artist, was my f f failed freshman year uh, as a non-art major. And everything else I've had to learn by the seat of my pants as I've gone. I didn't do it all on my own. I've had the privilege of looking over the shoulder of some of the best scientific illustrators of my time in the country and learned a lot from them. But I helped develop some of my own techniques as I went as well. Uh, Oh, that was my illustration interest, okay. Uh, a lot of the drawings I've done have been uh, in pen and ink. This is one called, uh, in fact, was Mayfly larvae that in fact was named after me. The genus name was Provonshaka, so it was from Madagascar. Uh, I also developed techniques uh, for uh, in graphite and, and pen and ink on drafting film and I've done an awful, awful lot of continuous drone, drone, continuous tone drawings like this one, it's another mayfly larvae. In fact, this was one that McCafferty described and he named it after his wife. This is Acentrella nadina. Uh, the work I'm, I've, I've, over the course of, I've illustrated, counted them, there was 11 books that I've provided the bulk of illustrations for and a number of others that I've got individual illustrations in. But the one I'm the proudest of is Aquatic Entomology that uh, Pat McCafferty wrote and I provided uh, 1,247 illustrations uh, that are in this book. And it was first published in 1981 and uh, most books have, they expect about a five-year life expectancy for the books. It's still selling. Uh, it's amazing. It's still being used and still getting royalties off of it after all these years. Uh, I've got a lot of continuous tone drawings that get in there. Uh, it's not only the aquatic insects, but also uh, semi-aquatic insects. This is one of the rove beetles that is found commonly along shorelines. This is graphite on drafting film again. And I also have a lot of, uh, like 150 uh, full color illustrations in there, such as the skimmer dragonfly. You might recognize this one. This is the same dragonfly that's uh, used on our Centennial, Centennial logo, which I was, felt very honored that they did that, put the full wings on it, which with computer was easy to do. Uh, I'm not sure how long I'm supposed to go with this. What time am I supposed to quit? We all leave by quarter to five. Okay, this is good. I will too then, whether I'm, <laughs> whether I'm through or not. Uh, 
that's kind of my basic career and what I've done here. Uh, I have frequently have felt guilty about the job that I have. I get to do puppet shows for little kids. <laughs> I, I got these puppets, they go, hi, I'm Betty B, and I'm Rocky the Cockroach, ha, ha, ha. And I get the, uh, my introduction to the things I do for second graders and stuff, and I have a lot of fun doing that, I enjoy it. I've got to teach college class on illustration, I've got to, to do a lot of elementary school presentations, and then I can leave after I've riled them all up and let the teacher deal with it. Uh, I got to go out and collect stuff all over the country and have fun doing that. Uh, I've got to identify lots of things. I got to name new species of things. I got to make lots and lots of drawings. And it was all the things I liked to do. And I got a job where I got to put all of those things together. And uh, I'm very grateful for that. Uh, one other little thing to put in your bonnet somewhere, I guess, is somewhere along the line when I was, was complaining to some friend of mine about, yeah, but if I'd done something else, I could be making a whole lot more money. Uh, his wise answer to me was, if money was no object, you had more money than you could ever hope to spend, what would you do to fill your time? Now, if you can find somebody to pay you to do that, you've beat the system. <laughs> There's so many people that are working at jobs they hate in order to make enough money to do the things they like. If you can have a job where you're doing things that excite you and you like, you beat the system. And so uh, whenever I wish that Dr. Yannanek would actually pay me more money, uh, <laughs> I remind myself of that. And he'll probably remind me of it next time he doesn't pay me any more money. <laughs> anyway. Uh, we're going to talk about the uh, a flood of biblical proportions. July 11th, 1981, a day that shall live in uh, infamy in the history of entomology here at Purdue. Uh, this, I put this diagram up here just to so you could get an idea of how entomology was laid out at the time. There was a back hallway, kind of like what they've got now that's attached to Whistler, but it wasn't attached to anything. And this was before Whistler, when they were preparing to build Whistler Hall. They were starting to build it. And it was partly under was construction. Hmm? The hole was bigger than that. Well, I know, but it's, I, this was the diagrammatical representation that I made in three minutes, okay? So, get off my case. Uh, the point I wanted to make is this, it was kind of this T-shaped thing, and the collections and a lot of other stuff, the chemistry labs and anything with heavy equipment, we were all down in the basement. And it's a half basement, you, you look at it, and you've been over there, uh, about four feet high where the windows start. and. Uh, down in the, the back of this and was back here where this is now, there was a ramp that went down to, for, from ground level down to where the door was at ground level of the basement. And I've been told, for whatever it's worth, that when back when this was the uh, ag hall, that originally down in the basement is where they milked the cows. And so they used to bring the cows down that ramp, and uh, we still had it there. Well, when they started to build Whistler Hall, they needed to put in new water piping, and they dug this uh, swimming pool-sized hole right outside the back door of uh, the T here. And uh, they put in this eight-inch water main in there. And at the end of the day, they weren't through with it, so they capped it off. They tested it, make sure it didn't leak and stuff. It was fine. The workmen went home. Everybody went home. Well, about 11 o'clock at night, after everybody had finished taking showers and flushing the toilet, the water pressure went up and blew the cap off the end of that eight-inch water pipe. And it filled up that hole with extremely, a slurry of extremely muddy water under great force. This is about 11 o'clock at night, and fortunately, the custodian was still in the building. And he said it sounded like somebody was frantically pounding on that back door, so he walked, walked back this hallway to see what was going on, just as these doors burst and this four-foot wall of muddy water washed him up the hallway. <laughs> <laughs> 
And, uh, but he was a bright guy. He'd been there for a while, and he understood about the collection, particularly about our type specimens and things, which are irreplaceable to science, because they're the specimens that a species is based on. And so the first thing he, first thing he did, smartly enough, was kill the main power. The second thing he did was go in and start pulling out the drawers, starting with the bottom and up, and he saved the, our type collection. Uh, the water was rising faster than he could work, and he finally called 911, and they, uh, people came and got it shut off. But before they could get it shut off, we had close to two feet of water in the basement of Entomology Hall. And so anything that was in file cabinets, <laughs> first two bottom drawers of the file cabinets, all of the up to uh, that two foot level in all of the museum cabinets was totally inundated with uh, water. Anything else that anybody had sitting on the floor or anywhere low was totally saturated, not just with clean water, but with muddy water. Well, anyway, they got the water fire department, they got the water shut off, and the physical plant crews came over and started uh, mopping out the building and getting squeegeeing it out and getting the remainder of the water out. They'd pumped out most of it. Well, our good physical facilities guys uh, that we can't see in here, it's dark, we turned off the power, and they went and turned the power on. The custodian said it was like the 4th of July in there. <laughs> Sparks were flying everywhere. That somebody didn't get electrocuted was a miracle. But what it did do, there was, across the hall from us was a chemistry lab, and they had like, you know, several hundred thousand dollar pieces of equipment that ran continuously, fried it all, eh? And, uh, so there were, there were a lot of problems. Fortunately, what happened, I was down, we had finished up the book, the aquatic entomology book, in June. And uh, the end of June, we sent off all, packed up all the drawings and sent them, to, it was like the 1st of July, I think it was, we sent all the drawings to the publisher. On the 11th of July, a little over a week later, we had the big flood. If it had happened earlier, three years worth of my work would have been totally destroyed. So, whew, on that one. But anyway, it was, uh, we fortunately, we had time, it was during the summer in July, we had a month or so to, sp we spread, there were papers and manuscripts and books and specimens and everything everywhere drying out uh, for a long period of time and trying to clean everything up. And, uh, it was clearly a case of negligence, and the university sued the contractor, and uh, we we're trying to figure out, we were given the, to, to figure out how much all the stuff we'd lost was worth. Well, they hired an art restoration guy who worked primarily on art museums that had some kind of damage, and they brought him in, and he, it was worth the money. He knew what he was doing. My artwork was never worth so much. <laughs> I'd pull out a piece that was all stained and stuff and, and pen and ink drawing. He'd say, how much do you think this is worth? I'd say, well, it took me maybe three hours to draw it, an hour, or maybe $75. He said, wrong. The value of that is not what it would take you to redraw it. This is an original piece of artwork that's been published and was drawn by a renowned scientific illustrator. I didn't realize I was renowned, but it turned out I was. And I said, that'd be about, a th it would, it, the value was what it would cost a, a professional art restorer to restore that back as close as possible to its original condition. That'd be about $1,000. <laughs> we went through every piece of my artwork that was damaged that way, and it came out to a tremendous number. We also, with the specimen, we had lost specimens from uh, not only Indiana and around the country, but places like Iran and Syria. <laughs> places you can't even get now, and Afghanistan, places you don't want to go necessarily now. And, uh, and again, he pointed out, you know, th these were irreplaceable. The th that specimen is a data set. That data set is now lost. But to replace it with a similar data set, you'd have to go to Iran, if possible, and collect the same species again. How much would that cost? <laughs> and that was the value of that specimen. Well. They settled out of court, and it was a very sizable, I'm not going to go into numbers, but it was a sizable uh, settlement. And we have uh, went into a trust fund, and, and uh, the department has been drawing off the interest of that ever since to help supplement things. 
But uh, anyway, that was the, the great flood of 1991, or 1981. I had, after I'd finished up the book, I had taken vacation and went down to, with my family down to Lincoln Boyhood State Park. And it was, I was down there and about 11 o'clock at night, the park ranger came and got me and said, you have an emergency phone call. And so we packed up the next day and came home and I was greatly distraught over the whole thing for a long, long time. Well, the other one is the big move, okay? And we were talking about this, and none of us reading over here when all this happened. Uh, well, I, I need to, to back up a little bit, because one of the things is a historical thing. Uh, John Osmond, who had hired me, and Turpin, and Bennett, and did, did, did he hire you, as, or did Ortman, Ortman hired you, Pete, did? And, uh, and we hired Virginia, right? Oh, yeah. And because uh, he was department head for what, 16 years, something like that, a long time. And he was a Wheeler dealer. I love John Osmond. I'm sorry with his passing. Uh, he knew how to manipulate the situation. He knew how to manipulate people diplomatically and get you to do what he wanted you to do. Always so diplomatic. Well, sometimes it was a little more blunt. Blunt to that. <laughs> Anyway, one of the things that I'm grateful, you were the only female in the department then, right? Well, in the School of Agriculture. In the whole School of Agriculture? About six years. Leland Chandler, bless his heart, who I loved and he was a great guy. But I remember him one time, I hope, I think he may have been, I don't know, he didn't know if he was joking or not, but he, this was in the early 70s and he said, hippies and women have no place in science. Well, he told me that if I didn't cease to believe in fake techniques, I was going to be fired. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, things were different there then than they are now. And it's one of the things I'm very pleased about. Of course, there, there were... Women didn't go into entomology because bugs were yucky for one thing, plus well, really the right, other, all the other. I wasn't a yeah, you nasty bug. Well, <laughs> hey Virginia, like I've told you before, all a nematode is is an insect without a head, thorax, abdomen, <laughs> and or legs or wings. So. <laughs> <laughs> no people in this <laughs> anyway, things I'm I'm grateful that things have changed, and if you look at both our. We've got a ways to go yet with our faculty, but you look at our student population, it's pretty evenly divided now. And oh, yeah. uh, fact, for a while there, we, we had more, 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 more females than females, yeah. so uh, it's good. Uh, but anyway, Osman retired, well he stepped down, he retired I guess in 1973, I think it was. Seven. He retired in 87. He couldn't have retired. Oh, I mean, I mean, 80, yeah, and not, I mean, because I came here and said it was 87. He but he stepped down in 72, was it? And uh, went off to be a big chief at the, with the EPA in, in uh, Washington uh, before he came back here. And then Eldon Ortman became the department head and was the department head for most of, a good portion of my tenure and appreciated the association with him. And then, uh, Chris, you came. Tell us again when you. In 1990 was when uh, Ocero came as department head, and uh, I had met him before, knew him, and, and had a great deal of admiration for him. Uh, he didn't give me big raises either, but I still had it. But anyway, uh, they came to us and announced that they were going to, I mean, they, it, it, you can correct me because you were there and some of the others that were there, but they basically came and had, we had a, a staff meeting or a department meeting and they told us they were tearing entomology hall down and they were going to move us to South Campus Courts down by the vet south or east of the vet school down there. And then they were going to build the new animal science, food science building there and then they were going to remodel Smith Hall and, and eventually move us here. And we started saying, wait a minute, their food science is getting all the perks and we're getting all the shafts. And we finally worked it out so that uh, they built the building first, they moved them, and then they moved, remodeled here and moved us in. But we still got our, our uh, fair amount of shafts. Moving, I mean, it's bad enough for those of you who have moved ever in your life, your own personal stuff is bad enough. Moving an entire department out from one building into another is a major piece of work. Fortunately, Whistler Hall was, was completed by then and a lot of our, our uh, 
staff and students were over there, which had given us a little bit more elbow room in, in entomology hall, and I actually had my own office by then. But we were told we were, we were going to move, and we did it. And uh, um, particularly moving the collection was a major, major chore. Well, they'd made all kinds of promises to us. Uh, did they ever keep any of them? <laughs> I don't think so. In fact, we were so run over by the whole thing that uh, Oseto resigned as department head in protest to the way in which the department was being treated in the whole thing. Uh, and we were all rather upset because we didn't get what they promised us in a lot of ways. And well, we wound up paying for things they'd originally promised they were going to pay for it. But anyway, we got moved over here. I was in like 1999 or something like that, 98, 99, something around there. And shortly after uh, that, one of the things that did happen with it was the, the saving of Entomology Hall. This is the second oldest building on campus, okay? And uh, at great historical value, the administration didn't realize the groundswell that was going to occur over their wanting to tear this down. And it got big enough, and Osmond was one of the ones he'd returned, and he was one of the leaders in this. And anyway, long story short, Entomology Hall got saved. It's now Fendler Hall, and, and the Wood Lab people are there, and we're here. And it's, it's great and fine. Uh, so uh, it's been a long tenure and a lot of ups and downs and backs and forth. I only got a couple more. I still got three more minutes, so I'm going to tell just a couple of trained dog, what I call trained dog stories and, and other stuff. This is my last slide. Trained dog stories are when people do exactly what they're trained to do and can't think outside the box at all. Now things have, if Tammy Luck was here, she'd be able to verify this, that things really have changed a lot with the physical facilities people over the years. I think it's much, much better today uh, than it was when I first got here. Uh, if you had something that broke, for example, you put in a paper request, maybe two weeks later, a supervisor would show up with his clipboard and say, yep, it's broken, and he'd write notations, and then he'd go away, and a few days later, some guy would show up and say, yep, it's broken. Uh, but shoot, I'm going to I don't have, I need a ladder to fix that, and I don't have a ladder with me, and it's 11 o'clock. I'm not making this up. This was actual happening okay, in my office. It's 11 o'clock now and lunch starts at noon. There's no sense in my starting now and he'd leave. A couple days later he'd come back and maybe get it fixed. But the other thing that they learned was they were, even if they were very capable individuals, they were to do exactly what was on that work order, no more, no less. And so whatever it was, they did. They painted the men's restroom over in there, and there were a lot of pipes running along the ceiling in there. And one of those pipes had a valve on it, and there was a great big huge tag about like this on that valve that said, do not remove this tag. And then it had instructions as to what that valve was for and what to do in case of emergency or whatever. Well, they painted in there. Well, they were supposed to paint everything, and they couldn't remove the tag, so they painted the tag, okay? <laughs> I had a, uh, in, in, when I moved into my, the, finally moved into an office in Entomology Hall, there was, I had a big uh, uh, fume hood in there that I didn't need, and so they took it out. But when they did, they left a little short piece of pipe about like so on the, on the wall. It was not attached to anything on either end, but it was onto the wall with a little bracket with two screws in it. Well, they finally got around to having computers, and they decided to run the computer. They had to run these conduits along the way back in those days and run the wiring through the conduit. Well, it was supposed to go through the wall right there, and this pipe is in the way. So what does he do? Rather than saying, oh, I undo these two screws and get rid of that pipe, that wasn't in the work order. He went up to that pipe, bent the conduit around, went around the pipe, and then out the wall. Okay, so it was that kind of thing. One of the problems I didn't mention when I first got there, and I need to because this was a biggie, they had, well, they were doing a lot of vector-borne disease research then, and so they had a fairly large uh, animal room with lots of rabbits and stuff in it, and it was right directly above the museum. And they had all this 
flow through stuff that wash the rabbit urine and poop away and stuff. Uh, but it didn't always work real well, and the drains would get clogged up, and the water would back up, and it would overflow, and when it overflowed, it would start raining rabbit urine in the museum. Sometimes right on me and my desk. Hey? And uh, it's to the point where it was, had totally deteriorated, all the water up there running around, it deteriorated the ceiling to the point where it was sagging, and they needed to fix it, but uh, it was time to paint, not fix, and so, uh, the paint guy got up on top of the cabinets and was, was going to paint the light fixtures and he grabbed, a, grabbed the hold of the light fixture and the water had shorted out the, the lights and it was short in it and it knocked him right off of the cabinet. And that was when they decided they needed to actually fix the ceiling and the electrical problem that it had caused. But those are some of the things we used to, to put up. One of the other ones that Tom remembers too was uh, along this line was uh, well, we were still in Entomology Hall when those first years. We came up with the idea of putting these flags that we have on the building now during Bug Bowl. We had flagpoles attached to the front of the building and ran these flagpoles out. Well, the guy that was putting them up and his supervisor came to make sure he was doing it right. And it called for putting a pin through the flagpoles fit into this flagpole holding and you put a pin through it. And he said, this isn't going to work. You know, it's, it's going to vibrate out, it could fall out, it needs to have a bolt. And he was yelled, I was there, and he was yelled at by his supervisor saying, you're to do what you're told not to come up, you know, blah, blah. So I said, okay, so we put the pin in it. And sure enough, that next day, the wind was blowing and that thing vibrated, and vibrated the pin out and the pole went, Phew. if it had hit somebody, it would have killed them because it was dropping like two stories down, okay, a big heavy flagpole. Fortunately, it missed them, but the next day we had bolts in them like he had suggested in the first place. But that was the kind of things we used to have to deal with uh, frequently. And fortunately, things have greatly improved. Uh, I could tell a lot more stories about some of the people that are here in the room, but, uh, <laughs> and others that are long gone, but the time's pretty well spent. So uh, that was my life here in the entomology department in a nutshell. Thank you very much. <laughs>